Hello, friends! Welcome to episode 203 of Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can, whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft, or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. Actually, I think it's 204. I think I did that wrong. Oh, Lord. Is it 204? <laughs> it is yeah, 204. It is 204. Man, this is the problem with I mean, us doing pre-recorded shows. You get, you get north of 200, and you just start losing track, man. It, I mean, we... <sighs> I will say north of 190 is what got me last time. Yeah. Like, once we yeah. break 190, it was weird. It was like, I, I don't know why 100 didn't do anything for me. Mm-hmm. But I, I think also part of that was, like, us switching venues, us changing how we were recording, and then just going whole cloth into making, like, here's the next 20 episodes that we need to do. Crap. That's a lot of stuff. And then we start doing them, and they just happen. And they just happen. Yeah. And they just happen. Yeah. It isn't until you, like, pause and take a breath and, like, step back, and you're like, we did 190 of this. It's 190 <laughs> hours minimum of us talking to each other across the desk. And now we're at 200. I have this I have this weird thing where looking down from, from great heights doesn't really bother me, but looking up and realizing the ceiling is right there above me <laughs> is actually what gives me vertigo, and I think that's what happens to you. You know, it's like that's fair. looking down from 100 didn't, didn't startle you, but looking up at 200 from 190, and you realize it's only 10 episodes away, you know? Yeah. And what's funny is um, I was literally just reading today because I'm I was I'm still kicking around going to Gen Con, mm-hmm. um, so that may happen this year. We'll find out. And if we do, if I do end up going to Gen Con, there are some people I'm going to end up meeting there mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. From, from that we've talked to that we've that we're running you know we're doing system spotlights and stuff on, um, which I'm kind of excited about and thinking about doing pretty heavily. But uh, w- somebody who was listing how many times they've been to Gen Con, how many games they've run. Mm-hmm. And because they were they were asked by they were like, oh, we're going to be doing a notice because you're such a prolific gamer. And he's like, well, game master. He's like, oh, yeah, I mean, I've run a few games. No, you've been running games for 12 years at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. And that's a minimum of like, I guess, 20 or 24 games. And he's like, oh, no, I mean, there's a lot more than that. I mean, most of those times I was running, you know, two or three games a day. For three days, yeah, for twelve years, and that's just ju- and he was like, "Oh God, I've written a lot. I've written so <laughs> many games. I've killed so many NPCs." You make him do the math. <laughs> yeah, and it, yeah. it catches up with you. The years just happen, and uh, it's both kind of exciting and also kind of terrifying yeah, at the same yeah, time. A but bit. Uh, this last week, we just this past weekend, we had our session zero. Yeah, for for, Nova Praxis for Sean's Nova Praxis, which game. is Savage Worlds Nova Praxis. Right, just to it's be clear, kind of system f- stuff, futuristic, uh, transhumanist, uh, kind of post scarcity, mm-hmm. utopian, but really, is it? You know, kind of. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I guess in an odd way, it's post apocalyptic because most of the Earth is Grey Goo right now. Yeah, yeah. And and there's a war going on there, which is its own thing and not even part of the setting, really. Right. You then have, like, this whole Star Trek kind of economy with replicators and, you know, you, you can do what you want, and yet there's this whole technology grind that's still going on and, and passing through the stars. And very much like Battletech, the, the, the space government has broken up into houses that kind yeah. of run everything as a coalition and... Uh, then you've got this kind of shadow run aspect of is, you know, what goes on in the shadows behind the utopia, you know? Yeah, which, again, I, I said uh, there's an old game called Syndicate uh, or Syndicate Wars. Yeah, 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 And yeah. Uh, that was very much this where, like, the world had an overlay mm-hmm. that was nice and pleasant. But when but, – you know, and everybody saw only the overlay. But when you pull that overlay off, you realize there's kind of a dystopian world wrapped around you oh no 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 everybody got along everybody once i went through with my persuadatrons <laughs> and converted the entire city that's fair to following me we were all good you that know? is i suppose that no, is I, I played syndicate too i know yeah 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 and once, I know you had, all about it. once you had the rail guns everything pretty much salt was solved oh, right oh yeah yeah yeah. but yeah, yeah. uh so tonight at sitting very quietly with their mute on i i appreciate uh we have two guests waiting to join us uh to talk about advancement and power which i think is fitting for what we just said yeah a couple episodes ago we, we talked about uh talked about just just kind of advancement systems in in games and we uh we threatened that we would be coming back around to the topic of power escalation and what happens when your power curve does not match the pro- the pace of your story and such like that the various complications that can cause and what you can do about it as a storyteller and and we we looked at it from one aspect which mm-hmm. is like do you do do you manage the curve do you not manage the curve and just have a flat game but we really didn't talk about 
what happens within the story? In fact, if I remember correctly, you told me, don't talk about that. We have a show coming up. You Stop told it. me to tell you not <laughs> to talk about it because we have a show coming up. And, and I think I, I did a, okay. And I was a dutiful podcast partner. You were. You were very much so. Uh, so here with us today, we have two authors who know very well about villain power curves since they've written them a few times, to say the least. Uh, Just a few. We have Autumn and Jesper. Autumn, uh, thank you for joining us. I, I know it's you're, you're on the same time with us, but Jesper, you are not. You are. It is late, late in the day, and uh, we appreciate that you've taken the time. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah, absolutely. It's We're all excited. pleasure. It's fun. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to pick on you, Autumn, since you've got a, a, you're a little more awake <laughs> right now. Um, you, you <laughs> tell me, you won a writing contest in high school. That kicked all of this off. What was that? Oh, it was just uh, for a senior year, sort of. Th Actually, I think everyone in the school could do it, and it was writing a short story based on a painting. And so I guess oh. I think I, I think I had some secret sauce there since I'm also an artist and actually oh. went on for, to study art. Um, okay. So it just really resonated with me. It was I remember it was on one of Monet's paintings. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I know Monet. But it was turning it into a story, and... I somehow managed to win that my senior year. Do you do you still find uh, a lot of inspiration in visual art? Yes, actually, a painting that hung in my office became the inspiration for what became uh, two sets of trilogies, my first debut novel. So yeah, definitely, art is always inspiring to me. I'm uh, dying to know which painting that is, actually. <laughs> Uh, you know, I can't name. even think of the artist now. It was a Mediterranean scene and kind of boring and not really well done, but I just started looking at it, and it was at a kind of an escape room to get yeah. away from the office, and I was in charge of the office, so, you know, someplace you go to be, like, alone for a minute. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it was there, and I would sit there and look at it, and... I just suddenly one day had like wondered, well, it's very elemental. It had earthy cliffs and the blue sky and a blazing sun and this water. And I'm like, ooh, elemental magic. And then I had this other short story with elementals, but it was modern day. And the two just clicked in that moment. And my first book, Born of Water, was born. That is wonderful. That's, that's great, actually. Yeah. So funny enough, uh, I, I, I've noted that you tend to do uh, primarily epic and dark fantasy. <laughs> yeah. You're this bright, like, oh, Monet, these rich colors and everything. Like, by the way, I do dark stuff. Yeah, I'm, she I'm... says she was trapped in an <laughs> office. I mean, I mean that, okay, that is, that is fair. So, uh, well, so, so where does this dark root come from in your writing? I think it's the desire. I think all light needs to have shadows, honestly. And I love playing with things. Like, just because you're dark, does that mean you're evil? Ah, uh, um, storyteller after my own heart. Yeah, I love playing with those grays and those shadow parts of the world. So I think that's where it comes from. And plus, I did work at the time, especially as a, a civil servant with the U.S. government. Ooh. And I used to joke that... Every time I was really annoyed at work, I'd go home and blow up another country in my story. So, yeah, it was cathartic. <laughs> I remember it's like, I remember saying, like, never piss off a writer. They'll kill you in every one of their stories. Exactly. In so many different interesting ways. I, I can honestly say I have put some NPCs in my role playing games for my players to kill that were people that I particularly or at least a trope of them. I will say that. So, uh, and, in it's that healthy. Uh, and in that you, you like Call of Cthulhu. Thulu as a world, which is another thing that Sarah pretty much adores that oh, yes. can't get to. Oh, yes. You and I can have long conversations. <laughs> oh, yeah. I just um, got a copy of the Necro Num 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 cookbook. So if you haven't seen that and you love Lovecraft, go look up the Necro Num Num Num. Oh, I am Googling that right now. <laughs> Have you, have you made anything yet? Have you made anything yet? I have not, but they oh. are real re recipes, and they do have translations. And I just haven't. I think I want to start with a cocktail. Oh, the, one with the eyeballs looks the best. Okay, okay, okay. I liked the Skyrim uh, book. One of our friends uh, got the Skyrim oh. cookbook, and it's the, the, they're actually really good stuff in that. Yeah, uh, but I picked up for you. The Cat-Thulu game. Cat-Thulu, yes. And it's adorable <laughs> and accurate. <laughs> uh, but That's all of the little spin-offs are there. They're adorable and yet still dark. Yet still dark. <laughs> Which is what I like. You yeah. can have fright, you know, 
highlights noble bright brightness is all the brighter when everything else is pitch black that is true so, that is true there you go that's true jasper thank you so much for for joining us uh and 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 coming through this the the, the darkness that is your night currently to to have a conversation with us <laughs> um you tend to wrap yourself with a lot more fantasy uh dragons and vampires and ridiculous dark gods that are all part of this this world that that both of you write, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, even more darkness, I suppose. <laughs> tell <laughs> tell yes. me a little bit more about this darkness. I, I know we spoke about it before, but I'm I'm intrigued about the seed that binds this world. Right. Yeah. So basically, we try to, or we have made a. I wouldn't call it multi multi dimensional, but more like several different kind of areas in this world or even planets if you want to call it that that is all connected by a center which we call the rift and inside the rift is where the dark gods and the dark energies are basically at mm -hmm. and in theory if you would dare i guess you could walk into the rift and through it and come out into another world but I don't quite know how you would survive, but um, you could try. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me a little bit of, like, Warhammer 40K. I was just going to say, I'm getting notes of Warhammer 40K, but I'm also getting notes of Brandon Sanderson's Cosmere. Yes. Yes. I actually right, remember, yeah. read a little bit about that. That the, tra the only way to get from point A to point B is by going through chaos or warp or something evil. Right, you know? right, right. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's no good way to travel. Like, Star Trek makes it look wonderful. You know, you just go to warp, and you're somewhere new. Or, like, Star Wars, you know, you go to warp. Maybe there's space whales. Maybe there's not. We don't know. Right. 40K, you, know? you go to we the warp. Know. You come yeah. out a mutant on the other end. Exactly. Or, or at least a few of your crew do, and yeah. they're all a little crazy, you know? <laughs> you know, maybe in your world they're also a little sad, have, you know, multiple depressive states, and, you know, are, are, are very much thinking about how bad everything is. But uh, this also has a hold on the magic system. This this concept of, it of does, feeling. Yes. To, uh, go go on into that. To, I, I know a lot of our listeners are going to are, are going to be interested in this this adjustment. Yeah, well, we were really trying hard when we created the world to come up with some magic system that would be interesting. And I don't know if I could call it different because I guess nowadays you can find whichever magic system somewhere. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> already created everything, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, but Brandon, Brandon to... Sanderson's got that, <laughs> that market <laughs> corner. God, God, do we hate that. He invites, invites one every, invents one every time he takes a shower, you know? <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> Indeed. But we tried to come up with something different, at least as, 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 as well as we could. And we decided to, base it the magic system system of emotions uh, that alone is not necessarily unique but what we did was we said that in order to channel spells you would have to channel a certain emotion so for example there would be certain kind of spells that are linked to being happy other spells that are linked to being sad and so on and so forth but then the trick part was basically two things one would be that you need to be careful only to channel that one emotion because if you accidentally channel two different emotions you will get a completely random spell effect that you can't control so maybe you blow yourself up or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> so it, imagine running away from the dragon and you have to use a happiness spell and you cannot make you you need to be very careful not to channel any sort of uh, being scared or or horror feelings at all <laughs> that alone should be pretty difficult um and then the other part we made was that there is like a feedback loop in the spell so for example if you channel channel happiness then as a consequence after you cast your spell you will be filled with like so much happiness that you would be like ecstatic afterwards and I'll also the opposite is true. If you channel disgust, you would be f completely consumed by disgust afterwards. So, ooh, ooh. yeah, it, it, I feel like okay, okay. Now I know we we talked a little bit, and you like Star Wars as well. Yeah. And there's there's a hard vibe of that like 
emotional pebble that they put inside of our uh, uh, between the jedis and the mm -hmm. the sith is Correct. that like you're yeah. not allowed to have emotions as a jedi because it clouds your ability to see things and yet the sith are basically driven by their this emotional state yeah and mm -hmm. that you know dig far enough back through the history of star wars and that wasn't always the case you had emotional jedi council people and mm -hmm. you know and yellow things and and i i keep feeling like this is there's 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 almost a, you know, I'll argue to say there's almost a better way to handle their dichotomy within this structure of, of understanding that emotion does have a drive. And yeah. that, that feeling does mean a lot more and can do a lot more. You know, love is powerful in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Sometimes unexpected ways. <laughs> I absolutely I absolutely love the, the idea that, that, that he described, though, of, like, um, you know, running from a dragon while trying to channel happiness. <laughs> And I just imagine the mental gymnastics you have to do to do that. Like, just you know, think of a happy thought. Guys, what? no, it's okay. We're getting our cardio in. This is great. <laughs> Are you insane? It's a dragon. I haven't ran this well in a while. I know. This guy's relentless. We're halfway to a 5K, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or I could see a, a futuristic version of this where, like, someone literally has, like, an, the app on their phone that, like, gives them, an, like, inclusive, but it's an AI, and it's like, hey, you've just done 5K, shut up, no, that's really good. <laughs> You know, that is that is pretty good. Okay, okay. You're still alive. You're smiling. You know? Here's your note for the day. You know, like a happy-go-lucky. Yeah. I could totally love that. Being uh, alive should make you happy. Yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, now, you guys had originally scheduled a writer's getaway that was going to be in California. Is that correct for this year? Is that, San Francisco, yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. Is that uh, scheduled for later this year, or you guys, did you guys put it off a full year? Put it off for a full year. Okay, we okay. Just Life got in the way. Uh, closing, Adam. Uh, I actually closing on a house um, next oh, Lord, week, oh. and yes, we also bought one recently. And life just kind of got really crazy for us um, in 2023. So we're hoping 2024 we're both settled and adulted enough that we can pull this together. Well, got congratulations, both congratulations, yeah. both of you on the, the the house purchases. Yeah, that's that is not an easy thing to do, especially you know at, at any point in life. I I always feel like housing specifically. There's too many choices to be made because your brain looks at the immediate things you need, and then you start mm -hmm. looking at all of those things you want to do. And if you've ever owned a house and you're moving into a new one, you you do that thing of, am I ever going to get to that? Can mm -hmm. I? Maybe I should mm -hmm. just buy it finished. Maybe whatever that <laughs> thing that I'm thinking of, let me just get it finished. And by the end of it, you're like, okay, I just need a finished house. Whatever it is, I need finished. And the decisions get made for you. Oh, it's a That's it's so a true. it's never ending. So let's speaking of. An escalation of power. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we we take a look at things from a storytelling point and uh, from a gaming point. And through that perspective for us, our characters, um, you know, who are sitting around the table at us, are experiencing a growth in power, a growth in levels. I mean, sometimes that's a flat progression like we talked about where it's where it's not necessarily a vertical like your plus one becomes a plus two becomes a plus four becomes a plus whatever and you're now you know backstabbing for 16 million points of damage and, and a pile of dice you know it might be that you have new abilities or you might have extended powers that have now happened or other events um but what we're talking about and kind of focusing on is that change in the story as you do develop as a larger character and what that means to what happens in the world around you. Because at level one, goblins are an easy enemy. They're 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 plentiful, they're small, they're annoying, and they probably could kill you with enough of them biting at your ankles. Yeah, sure. But like literally you step to like level three and suddenly goblins are pointless to even throw it in at, at a at a normal character. Unless you're throwing them a dozen at a time. You know, with a lord behind them. Right, right. You know. And Dungeons and Dragons. Them. What was? I'm sorry. What was that? Catapulting them at the characters. <laughs> you know, I've read about that. I think it's effective. Uh, <laughs> but then, like, you need to throw larger things, i.e., the dragon at the characters. But even at a certain point, it that almost feels like it's too much. So, I guess the opening question that I I throw out is, what is really the value of this power actually escalation what what value does it have within the story and within the players well for one i think it it definitely depends a lot on 
what the group wants out of the game. Um, I, the, the more, let's say, stronger or more powerful the characters become, the grander the scale becomes as well. So mm -hmm. at some point you'll get up to like demigod kind of characters that can do almost everything and you have to really ramp up the the tension to to get them threatened. I mean, some, some groups like to play that kind of grand scale stuff and others don't. So I, I think for a start, it, it, the question is whether you want to do it or not. But if you do want to do it, I think there are some different challenges that comes with it, meaning that for one, how do you keep the tension going so that mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like a walk in the park every time you play? You know, well, yep. nobody can beat us anyway, so we just do what we want. Um, and to that end, I think just throwing bigger and bigger monsters on people is not necessarily that. At least not, that's not the kind of story I like. Mm -hmm. um, so you could play with different things like downstream impacts of the character. I mean, if you're like a demigod and the stuff you do would affect things in a quite big grand scale. And lo and behold, some characters and players don't really think through their actions sometimes. So, <laughs> what do you mean my actions have consequences? <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, and I think there's there's, there's there... some stuff you can play with there. Yeah, um, I mean, and you... then of course as well, characters should be even though they get better in a higher level and more power, they should still be they're still like human beings uh, or whatever race they are but they, they still have people that they care about or places that they care about yeah so you can always be the nice and evil gm who start threatening <laughs> those things mm -hmm. very true mm -hmm. so so we have the 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 people who want the power fantasy like yeah whether it's the characters or not it's the it's the players at the table who are running said characters looking for that power gain fantasy definitely um i also have seen a lot of people who just like knowing that they're progressing through a story that it's not just the same monotonous character being driven in the same direction against larger odds oh sure sure you know having a physical character sheet that shows progression is something i mean i don't know about you but i know a lot of kids when i was in high school and even in college who liked looking at their gpa on a day-to-day -day basis they wanted to know that they were 4.0 as always no matter what they were doing that they were they were simply the best. Wow. I hope they and their pocket protectors are doing well today. <laughs> Funny enough, a lot of those people were not geeks. They were jocks. They huh. were they were they were studious students. And it was I, I, I it's that they just liked seeing that advancement. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily even above anyone else. It was just like I'm doing great for me. Yeah. And I mean, there's something to be said for that. No, it, it absolutely makes sense. I mean, you know me. I'm I'm even more of a narrative player myself. But like, you know, I, I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that I wasn't looking, you know, eyeballing at seventh level spells on my <laughs> wizard, going like, someday, <laughs> see, someday I will have that. That's that's yeah. what I think is not necessarily an, uh, a a a. I'm not going to say that's a power trip. But mm -hmm. definitely games that set that expectation where you see 1 through 20 and your eye goes immediately to, like, level 19 where you can do that one well, yeah, thing. yeah, of course. Like, I, I mean, I think if, if you lay that linear progression out, if you, if you lay out a, a vertical progression scale, mm -hmm. right, you're immediately going to look to the top of the scale and go, like, okay, where am I going to end up? Yeah. You know, what can I do at the end? What can I expect at the end of this story? And you start thinking of, like, what that climactic, you know, moment is going to be and what your part is going to be in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that's 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 a bad thing. I mean, we we've, we've we've talked before about power fantasy as, as a critical aspect of, of role playing games. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And and how, you know, again, they, I think it, it, it gets used as a dirty word, but I don't think it is at all. You know, I think it's a very valuable part of our enjoyment of of these sort of things. Yeah. Um. And I think that power fantasy just gets greater the the the, the sharper the vertical you know climb in the power is. You know. Yeah. Uh, Autumn, I'm going to ask you a question. Since you do Call of Cthulhu and you like the ten <laughs> the dark, do you find that are, do you find the roller coaster aspect the the idea of just the tension to release and then that greater tension coming like you know that the story itself not even your character but you know that the story is going to ramp up at some point some elder god is going to rear its head is <laughs> is that where the the power hits you 
Yeah, I, I think so. And that's what I was going to add to what you were saying is that I think it's the, the story. It's part of the story arc, you know, getting to grow as a character that is so interesting, but also those surprises. But yeah, the gaining, you know, knowing something, you can turn a corner and it could be something, you know, it could be the fluffy kitten. The fluffy kitten could actually be a god that wants to eat you. You never know. And so it's those those unknowns that make it really kind of fun. <laughs> but I also think, I think of like stories, like I was actually thinking of Supernatural, which I loved as a TV show. Oh, yeah. Yeah, except yeah, yeah, yeah. It kept repeating, like, the characters, Dean and stuff, they never, he was in purgatory for a year and became this kick-ass, you know, slayer. Yeah. But he was, like, still failing in the next series, the next season. And I'm like, shouldn't he have learned something? Why aren't they writing this in a little bit more? Because the show should have ended after season five, that's why. Mm, that's Probably. Fair. When when they Probably. killed everybody and, and, and Dean went to hell or something like that, and yes. uh, they fought the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and yes. you could tell the story was supposed to end, and then season six started, and you could tell they just kind of went, oh, God, what now? Money. Well, yeah, and yeah. they just kept repeating it. Yeah. And that's the last thing you want to do to the players sitting at the table is have them repeat season six over mm -hmm. and over yeah. and over again. You want to give them something else, and that can mean ramping things up. Not just new new monsters, new gods, but different power, different spells. It's exciting. Yeah, you can only fight bandits so many times. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like even overpowered bandits because yeah. now they have to meet the level. I think that was one of the things that we've talked about a lot of times is like, like you said, you're doing the same thing over again, but you have to ask yourself like these bandits that we fought at level two, which were challenging. We now do the Skyrim thing and go back later because we're big and butch. And suddenly they're just as butch. Because they're they, all bandit lords. Right. So <laughs> who could literally take over the world. Right. And I, I kind of, but look they're at, living in a cave, you know, <laughs> or, or ruins of all things. Right. Like, right. They have unbelievable power. Unbelievable. The riches that they have on them. If they you know. sold just one of their swords, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But at the same time, you, I think that's where some of the scaling breaks off. Like you were saying, like the, these people have gone through literally hell and back, become mm -hmm. all of this awesome power, and yet literally around the corner, it it means nothing. And it's I I don't necessarily feel that the that it's it's a failing on on the the ramping up of the power, but I do feel it's a failing on the story, like you said, like. If these things were out there before in in the world, these this this negative force, whether it's you know NPCs or demons or whatever, like wh where were they in season one? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't make any sense that these bandits who are unbelievably in power aren't just taking over the world. Like <laughs> they clearly didn't ramp up at the same scale, you know. And I I think that right there lends to the problem of story is that a lot of times we look at these pre-crafted adventures and the ramp within them basically just fails because if you look at it from a story complex you say why didn't this end a different way like why didn't it start a different way right with right. this kind of power curve so i guess the question then says it lends us to as storytellers what can we do to raise uh, to to follow the power level of the PCs, what what are I mean, not to say that all these are good ideas, but there are definitely ideas out there that have been floated. And like you were saying, uh, yes, is that there are uh, there are ways that you can get to the PCs without physically contacting the PCs, if mm -hmm. you will. You mm -hmm. can still make mm. you can still reach that point. So so what are some things that we can do as storytellers? What things that you have done to your characters and your <laughs> yeah. worlds that are that raise those stakes as the as the uh, as those characters grow? Yeah, because it's funny, we get so easily hooked up on combat all the time, don't we? Mm -hmm. We do. It's, it, I don't know why, but it always ends up like, okay, which monster in the monster manual can I find now which is threatening? Instead of looking at some other ways of keeping the game interesting and keeping the tension up, right? Thank I mean, you, yes. It's it's so strange. I mean, I, I love, you know, playing with the storylines instead you know mm -hmm. both of course the character growth but also like incorporating mysteries into the game like the characters might be able to beat almost everything but they don't understand what is going on here and they have to try to figure it out you know those kinds of things i love doing that yeah it seems like that's kind of the plot of pacific rim actually uh yeah. 
I don't know if you've ever seen that movie or not, um, but it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. on the surface about giant robots fighting giant monsters. You know, it's this big spectacle, yep. but like underlying all that, it's like, wait, wait, I mean, okay, but why? Where are these monsters coming from? Why do we have to deal with monsters all the time? You know? Yeah. What, what are they doing <clears throat> in this particular world? Like, is and the real question is, does the story support that well enough? You know, and some stories are bad at that, and some stories are amazing at that. Mm-hmm. You know. It's it's having it, and I, I think it is the way that it is deployed to the audience, in our case, our players at our table, not even necessarily the characters. Um, in your case, the books in, in description, you know, how do we explore that? How do we show to the players? How do we turn that meta hand, if you will, a little bit to show things off? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's easy to say that, you know, villains shouldn't just get stronger. Like, they have their own growth. It's mechanically appropriate that they should grow and sake. But there's nothing to say that there's a narrative reason for the escalation. I would say almost to the fact that narratively, you want your villains to be powerful. You want them to show into the world, not even that these characters matter. Um, I, I always like going back to the concept that your characters don't mean anything in the world until they have an impact. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, if, if, if it's the very powerful villain... In the beginning, I mean, from a storytelling perspective, there might be very good reasons why the characters doesn't come across that villain at that point, because at that point, they're nothing like, they're just like ants to him or her. Like, Mm -hmm. he doesn't care about the characters. Mm -hmm. It's only once they get up to a certain level that this villain will start paying attention to those people that keeps uh, coming in, in, you know, and stopping my plans. What are they doing? Those uh, annoying characters over there. So at some point, he, he or she will start paying attention to the characters, obviously. But still, once you get to that level, you probably pretty quickly get into a situation where the villain wouldn't be able to stand up against the characters in a straight-on fight. So I think, like, it's like when we write our novels, uh, Autumn and I, we always make our villains very, very smart. You know, Mm -hmm. they outwit the characters and they get to become these really, really annoying villains that you just so badly want to kill, but you just cannot get your claws on them. Because they never put themselves in a position to do so. Yep. Yeah. I, Yeah. I, 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 I... I often read and and remind other new game masters who are like, okay, well, my my players could totally defeat my villain at this point because I, you know, I I didn't make them a god; they're just a person, and these players have been, you know, playing for so long. How do I make this interesting, this fight interesting for them? And the answer is, don't put the villain there because he's smart enough not to be there. Right, right, right. You know, and is that something that? makes the game feel cheap and i would say no because it tells the players that no matter how strong you get you have to get smart as well yes you have to meet them at their level the idea that thanos can still achieve his goal doesn't mean that the story is over it means that you now have a new turn now you're not fighting thanos you're fighting yeah. the, the problem that he created mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. You know, it's... Yeah, I agree. I, I think the main thing is just uh, w- whether you're a game master or you're writing a novel, the, the main thing is just that you cannot use cheap tricks. You mm-hmm. know, um, it cannot be like, uh, well, he he suddenly escaped because he just used a fly spell and he did that four times already and uh, or a, an invisibility, po- invisibility potion or whatever. It, it has to be something that feels sensible and real to whether it's the player or reader, but something like, I can see that that would happen. It's not just like some trick you pulled out of your pocket because you needed to get the villain out, out of there, right? So you definitely need to think about how you're doing it. Yeah, smart villains are definitely the right way to go. I think the other one uh, that gets me kind of leans back more toward the Call of Cthulhu where you would, in what you had kind of expressed earlier, which was that sometimes the, the monster or the, the big bad guy really doesn't even know what you're doing. Like their their plans are so grand, and you're such an ant to them that they're like, "Excuse me, like did you did you just acknowledge me?" Like, <laughs> and and it's that it's that larger than life God design where you, you really don't matter, but they're intrigued. It's that uh, that that Street Fighter moment, you know, for you the day that uh, Bison visited your tiny little insignificant village was the greatest day of your life. For me, 
it was Tuesday. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think uh, I I think the on, the that onset uh, was something that you had kind of uh, broken into a little bit, Autumn, about uh, that godlike villainy. That it's it's a different design. You you have to look at, uh, and I, I'm trying to remember the the statement, but you said in when a when you're dealing with a god, they don't look at the the setting the same way as the characters do. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's totally. They have other cares and concerns, and I mean, it is stepping back and thinking, what does a god care about? I mean, are they looking at a universe, or is their time scale even the same as ours? So, you know, we could be just little ants, and maybe we can bite. Maybe we're fire ants, and we're we're powerful and can be incredibly annoying. But you know, they probably have insecticides that can take care of us very quickly, <laughs> and spells and other things. But you can get their attention, and when you get to the laser focus, like a magnifying glass of a god, that is going to be incinerating. Maybe you really don't want to do that, but it is fun because maybe as a human, maybe we can't also understand as a player. We don't understand the full force of what we're poking at. So it can really come around and cause some interesting effects, interesting potentials for twists. And we've talked about like double twists, just you don't always know the effects and that can be super fun to write, to have something that comes up and goes completely sideways that you don't expect but like Esper says, makes complete logical sense when you realize the clue was laid back, you know, 10 chapters or rounds or games ago. Oh, yeah. I'm sure, and I'm sure, you know, coming from a Call of Cthulhu background, too, the, that, uh, you know, the summoning forth the unknown from, you know, eldritch, you know, realms uh, is is something that that's kind of stock of, you know, of that game. Yeah, and uh, that's also why I love Call of Cthulhu because you don't have this power <laughs> problem at all. It's the it's the opposite problem. It's like, how long am I gonna stay alive? <laughs> right, right. You don't have power escalation. You have power deterioration. Your characters yes, kind of yes. slowly go insane. Like, there's a little bit of a spike once you get to that one level where, uh, at, at least in the most recent edition, where your sanity drops low enough that you stop being affected by things and you start getting really good at magic. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. then, but yeah, but. But then you deteriorate enough after that that you just end up in the loony bin. <laughs> yeah, you always end up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, I mean, to that, again, like, sometimes you're you're laying that seed down early on by stating that whatever your, whatever your current problem is, is merely a cultist to the thing that he's at that's actually doing the effort. And and that often, like I think uh, Vox Machina did this with the the dragons. There's always there's always a bigger dragon behind the dragon you're yeah. currently dealing with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that that mm. that staging of of you know right now I'm just fighting the henchman and this henchman is hard enough as it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I I think that the other half a twist that can be put on this uh, to twist a story is that the twist doesn't always have to be that there's a bigger bad guy behind door number two. It can often mean that the bigger bad guy who sent, you know, who, what you think is the bigger bad guy, the, 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 you know, let's say King who's been, you know, at war all this time, his general is the bad guy and has done things that maybe were a little beyond what should happen. And has he just recognized that that wasn't good? Like, Oh, you killed my general. Thank you. He was he was bad. That's mm -hmm. not what I intended. <laughs> and he did some things here that we have to now undo. Because all I was trying to do was take over this world, this continent. And now there's some elder thing going on that I don't want. Right, right, For any right. of these people. Like, he went one step beyond. And now you have that turncoat of a, a villain trying to redeem. Yeah, yeah. You know, exposing everything that happened. Like, here's it all. Here's everything. Help me fix this problem. Print Zuko in Avatar. Yeah. You know, where he's like, oh, wow, I just realized what is going on. And the Avatar really needs to stop my dad. And oh, my sister's I, insane. <laughs> oh, I need to go join him. All right. I got to help him. Yeah. Oh, crap. I spent two seasons trying to kill him. All right. Hold on. <laughs> like, how, how do I best handle this conversation? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, Hi, Aang. It's Zuko. <laughs> yeah. But... I think the other thing that we can talk about is that false ending. 
that, like, I pushed the button three minutes ago. Oh, yeah. I don't care what you do to me. It's over. No, you know? and, you know, now that we're talking about a uh, uh, Call of Cthulhu, like, mm-hmm. I just, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to track down the cultists the whole time, and you get there just in time for them to summon, like, a swarm of Bayaki or something like that. Sure, you know? something, something horrific. Something awful and beyond description, and now you've just got to deal with this. And they probably do, too. They probably had no conception of what they were trying to invite into the world. But, right, you know. right. <laughs> Yeah, usually they don't. <laughs> hey, I, I'll, I'll ask this question because uh, obviously we don't want to ruin any of your books or anything like that. But have you ever written yourself into a villain hole where you've you've put yourself to the point where like, OK, my character's gotten to this point and oh, crap, like this is just going to be a fight. Like this is not where I want to be. There's because... there's no way that my character with their with their my, my main character with their abilities will not just walk in there, snap their fingers, and win. You or know? worse yet, will walk in there not just instantly get vaporized, kind of a thing. Like I've built them up to this point, but even this doesn't feel right. Yeah. Have you ever got hit that point? Mm, not so much, no. But but I think this is also a matter of whether you are. Uh, what we call pantsing your stories, basically you're just writing as you go or whether you are plotting them, uh, which we do quite a lot because we co-write. So we are dependent on knowing exactly where things are going and what's going to happen. So we do sometimes have trouble during, let's say, the story creation part or the brainstorming sessions on, okay, how are we going to make this happen and how how is this going to work? But once we, you know, sort that out, then... The writing, we have the plan for what's going to happen, so we 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 don't really end up in those situations. Right, right. Yeah, I was going to say the the only time that really happened is before Jesper and I started writing together uh, with my like first trilogy. I did have a villain who I always joked could outthink me. I never knew what he had planned, and he would do something in three chapters later, like oh that was what he was up to, and I really thought he was going to win the whole novel. <laughs> but I did like to throw in the heroes. They often overreacted, and they would make the first battle. They would make the first insult and injury. And it was really funny when I stepped back from writing it going, so the villain was usually the one hanging back and doing some plans, and they're the ones running forward and smacking him and causing all sorts of retribution. And just like, well, that, that was a different way of doing things, and I didn't even really attend it. I would say that's a pretty accurate mirror of, like, most Dungeons & Dragons games, though, honestly. <laughs> well, I, I honestly think that that's how they, they, they should be done. Yeah. And then you, unfortunately, I think we, we run the risk to to storytelling from a DM's perspective of you have to be proactive. You have to throw things at them to keep things. But realistically, the answer is everything's there and in place. They're just moving really fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, we often talk about like how long is a D and D campaign in time in the actual timeline. And if you just run event to event, like in three months, they're fifth level and stomping gods, Yeah, you know, kind of a thing. And your villain was not prepared for that. I think somebody did the math Mm. and they said, like, if you do the actual, like quote unquote, adventuring day suggested in the D and D player's guide, um, Mm -hmm. that, your characters will reach 20th level within two months or something like that. Two physical wow. months of time. Two actual physical months if you assume that they are adventuring uh, five out of the seven days a week, take weekends off, you know, sort right. of thing. Right, It's like It's like two or three months or something like that if you're doing 13 That's encounters a day or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, Can I, I have that at my current job? That is That's streamlined, great. yes. <laughs> I, I, I go back to the... Uh, and it's uh, all thanks to Skillshare. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> wow. <funny>. Wow. <laughs> um, there, was a, there was a guy who talked about, uh, and I can't remember, the, it was a, I want to say it didn't start as a TED Talk, but ended up being one, uh, where he talked about how long it takes you to master something. And he said, uh, a year of constant work will let you get to a master level. But it doesn't mean you're, you know, you're you're an expert. You can do it at the mat. You, you can definitely be there. Mm-hmm. The answer there is, but you're not going to go on stage and and personally solo, you know, as a violinist. You're, but you're in that top, you know, five percent. Well, it's a big difference between replication and innovation. Correct. Yeah. You know, you still have to have sixteen years of jazz practice to really be able to improv. Like a god. Mm-hmm. But that's the difference between, like, getting to that top 5% and going from 5% to 4% to 3% of the top. Yep. You yep. know, we, we, we get there, yet 
games do not apply those rules in the least. The curve basically dies. No, they really don't. You know, at the top yeah. scale. Um, and so we have to do this in our stories. We have to make these Bond level villains who've been out there for 30 years and Bond just showed up. <laughs> and he's wet behind the ears, barely able to finish his martini before a bunch of henchmen go and shoot at him, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we end up building these these elaborate situations to handle these this escalation of power. But I think in that, we we miss, like you were saying, sometimes when the villain just sits back. Sometimes when, uh, when, when the god really doesn't notice them because it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Like you're you're barely itching me. Like there's nothing here to be said. But I think there's also that whole the the, the piece that you struggle with that, that I do all the time, which is the machination that happens. That this you are a cog in the machine. Yeah, you know, yeah. you you barely recognize that what you just did was was flip one switch on a board of thirty six. Good luck finding the rest of them. Have a nice day, tiny heroes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it's that scope yeah. that's so much larger. Yeah, and, and sometimes, I mean, maybe it's not supposed to be so that the characters understand or even get to understand what the god is doing, because who knows what they're doing? Maybe we can't even conceive it. Um, but I, I do think in this whole conversation, like the social agreement within the player group and between the players and the GM is so important, right? Because it, it really comes down to what kind of game is it that we want to play? Oh, it really and is. once we get to a high level situation, what are we looking for then? What do you want out of it? Do you want just like more dungeon crawling and smashing monsters? And is that what you want? Then okay. Uh, but maybe it's not, right? Maybe we don't even need to concern ourselves so much with it. And, and we need to build a different kind of story. Literally a conversation that Rob had at his last game. After 10 years okay. of running my campaign, <laughs> yes. I literally was sitting at my table and I'm like, guys, do you want to finish this in D&D &D and slog your way through rolls and hours and possibly days of combat? Or do we want to do this in a different system and just enjoy the ending? And just storytell it, yeah. And literally everybody <laughs> said, oh god, no, we don't want to play D&D &D anymore, come on, please. <laughs> Yeah, after after ten no, years I... of it, it was it was a funny and wonderful and and beautiful conversation because uh, everyone went around and basically talked about how they wanted to see the ending. They wanted to have right. a heroic ending. They didn't want to sit around for four hours for a single combat against monsters and a god. All right, but we also talked about you know the feelings that we wanted yeah. out of out of the ending too. I mean, this was ostensibly a post apocalyptic story you're telling here. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and a lot of us had already suffered so much loss and there was already so much destruction in the world that, like, we felt like if we if there weren't a happy ending, if there weren't some sort of an uptick in the end. I mean, we're not saying, that, you know, we need to win without any losses or anything like that. You know, mm -hmm. obviously sacrifices are going to happen in the big climactic story. But, mm -hmm. like, you know, we, we all decided basically that, like, yeah, we kind of, you know, we, we feel like we've put the work in. And if you make us bleed for the victory and mm -hmm. you make us feel bad about the victory none of us are going to walk away feeling good about what your story was yeah you yeah know? and in that communication like we say all the time and thank you for for validating us in, in in this a little bit more is that and we say it to everyone we we bring up communication being the key to all good role play oh absolutely like it's a table of individuals who w all want to have a shared experience there's nothing to say that you can't change that at any time during the story now you two are you two are co-authors, uh, so I, I imagine um, you know in, in collaborating on stories and such like that, you have moments where you disagree on uh, the direction of the story and whatnot, or or even you know have an emotional response that maybe you didn't you didn't anticipate or or is is a negative experience for you in the direction the story is taking. Um, you know, I. I hear I already hear Amber laughing about that. Or, uh, Autumn, or I'm sorry, Autumn <laughs> laughing about that. Uh, can can you can you tell us uh, a little bit about uh, how that is on your end? Oh, I honestly think it's funny because we so rarely disagree, and we usually just get each other more excited. Like, oh my god, that's, I didn't think of that. That's perfect. So mm -hmm. um, we're usually piling it on. Um, okay. I can't think of a single thing where it was like, no, this is like absolutely I. <laughs> I mean, I know for the one book we've written together, the one character, I was like, I think she's a little weak and I want to buff her out more. She's just, she's crying and she's supposed to be sort of like, not quite heroine. That's more the third book she gets to heroine stage, but she's a bit of a wuss. 
And <laughs> right, right, and she's okay. Like, okay, yeah, write, write it however you want. I'm like, okay, well, there you go. That was our argument. There you go. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I think we, we tend to do the same thing. Like, we've had a few times where we've been talking about various stories, and, like, you've come to me or I've come to you with an idea, and we had the horse blinders on briefly of, like, this is where it's going. Yeah. You know, but now I'm lost because I'm, I've been staring straight ahead that I've lost it, and all we have to do is pull one of those blinders to the side and be like, did you look over here? <laughs> oh, my God, no, I didn't. Okay, great. Nope. And I, all my plot just happened in the last three seconds. Thank you. I got it. You know, yep. we're good. <laughs> I, I, I like that about bouncing ideas, and yeah. I feel that more collaborative storytelling at the table is a great way to get that. Like, yeah. giving yeah. your players the opportunity to write a bit of fiction. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. You know, you know, and, mm. and that, that's why I'm a huge advocate of you know vibe checking with your with your with your players too. Mm -hmm. You know, like how how are you feeling about the story so far from your character's perspective? Are you getting what you want out of the story? Do you feel like you want more political intrigue? Do you feel like you want more combat out of it? And and even more specifically, of like you wrote in your character's backstory that like your village was ransacked by this dude. Do you want to hunt him down? Is that important to you? Do you need this to be a major focus in the game or, you know, or whatnot? And then, you know, you might just end up with that, you know, it may just take a quick a quick adjustment in your notes and suddenly that character that that NPC's name is now the name of your main villain. Or a working, villain. Yeah. Or a villain working from the shadows just because they said, Yeah, I really want to kick this guy's ass, you know? Yeah, the the key is really to value the other's input uh, instead of getting pressures about your own mm -hmm. and and yes. try to defend that why your own viewpoint or your own uh, own idea is the right one you know it i i think autumn and i we are lucky enough that none of us do that we we are always <laughs> like open to the other one's inputs and then we just go with it and usually the end result becomes much better than what we could have done on our own um mm. but i do i would say that if you were very precious about your your own story or your own characters or whatever it may be it will def definitely generate more conflict that's for sure <laughs> um and also from a let's say gaming perspective as a as a gm if, if you ask your players for input about what they think so far what they like and don't like then take it to heart you know don't ask if you don't want the answer <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. They're giving you the cheat codes on how to make a great game. Mm -hmm. You know, they're telling you what they want. And if you just give them what they want, within reason, mm -hmm. within reason, obviously, if they're like, you know, hey, I want 15 magic items, like, maybe... <laughs> Maybe have a conversation about that, but, you know. The question is, is why do you want 15 magic items? Right. Well, I want to feel like a god. Okay, okay, so what you're really saying is you're looking for more power fantasy. And that's the way the I therapist can... steps in at the right, table. Exactly. We have to listen beyond the words that are said to <laughs> Read you. Read between the you know, lines. It's, it's, it's that deep thought where they're just like, I need to have this because I, I, I need to feel like I'm powerful. Tell me about your character's mother. Don't you do that. <laughs> <laughs> they step back immediately. They get called out. You know, it's it's that it's that question that sits just behind where they're going with what they're doing. Right, right, and, right. And some players don't know it until it hits them. I didn't know one of my characters was a whole section of my own personal life that I was just subwriting <laughs> that I didn't even recognize was there until you're like, tell me about this. And I was like, shut up. There are one D six characters. There are one D six skeletons in your closet. Roll for initiative. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to, I'm going to bring up something here a little bit at the end um, to kind of put this is that, is there a point to not escalating the villainy? Is that, is there a, is there something to be said for the Spider-Man who's fighting the same bully he fought at the beginning now effortlessly? Is there something to be said for, you know, that that uh, that group of goblins who were just annoying that they never took out showing back up like, yeah, now we're going to get you or or D'Artagnan's uh, girlfriend's brother who's finally showed up to get her honor taken care of. And it's like, but really? he's a musketeer now, buddy. <laughs> yeah, he's got like 14 million friends who are behind him. Yep. Is there something to be said for those types of scenes and or even to sit within the fiction? Do you guys find that those kind of moments are important to help with, I don't know, I, I guess a curve to the power fantasy? S signposting the progress of the, of the protagonist. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's what I was going to say is it shows how far they've come and what they've managed to accomplish. And there's something to be said, especially like if you're writing a story and maybe that's just a hurdle. So you have one that's at the beginning and they fail 
and they run into the same situation later and they succeed. Now they're ready to maybe move on if there is another climax, but it's a nice, I love wrapping things up. That's what, you know, life doesn't have those wrap up moments, but it's nice when we can bring that into a story or a game and you can have that sense of satisfaction and looking back saying, yeah, I'm doing better. I accomplished something. Give me a cookie. (laughs) (laughs) No, I, I, I will agree with that concept, especially for my work, is that I, I remember talking to a friend who was at an interview for a new job and uh, they set forth. They're like, well, we're, we, you know, here's our, our phone system and here's our networking system. And he's a network engineer. And he was just like they were just like, how would you handle this? And he just started talking because in nine times out of ten, when you're sitting in an interview, you have to like there's a certain level of bullshit. Like you're just trying to get into the job because you have no <laughs> like you have skill sets, but at the same time, like you're just getting a job. Let's let's be honest. You know, the interview is is who can BS who until the end. Yeah. You know, and then just do the work that gets handed to them, um, whether it be what they told you or not. But he sat there and he started to outline the entire process, and he said about twenty minutes in, he actually paused himself and went, "I know what I'm talking about. Oh God, no." Like, like <laughs> I, I am a network engineer. Well, crap. I guess I stopped BSing about five minutes ago. Like, this could, this is probably the right way that it should work. And I'm looking at this going, I can do this job. I can do this job. And it's, it's a, there's a joyful moment in that, in that realization. Definitely. I think it, it, there's, and it's great to give that to someone. I, I love sharing happiness, which is why I do write Noble Bright usually. Mm -hmm. And even in my dark fantasy, the hero, you know, there's usually a light at the end of the very dark pitch black tunnel. But I I will ask that. How do you do that? How do you how do you put a a matchstick or or a lighter at the end of the dark tunnel for something like that? Because I think it's knowing again, knowing your characters, knowing the people who want what is that one core thing they want to see happen. And just when they really think they have lost it and there is no way for it to ever happen, having it happen in Mm -hmm. some way they didn't expect after a really horrible slug. I think that's the way to bring that moment about and leave just a sense of satisfaction that I got that one thing, the one thing I wanted and but it's you have to know what that one thing is, whether it's your character or the people playing in the game, to know what is really impactful. You take your take your small victories, yeah. yeah. The, 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 that city slickers moment, the one thing. <laughs> like if I figured out what that one thing was. Yeah, yeah. But uh, okay, all right. Do do you have anything else you guys want to add to this? Something that came up in 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 our thoughts here that that might want to pop out. Mm, I don't know, but I, I think it's really a, about making sure you're having fun at the end of the day, right? I mean, I mean, personally, I don't like the high, very high power levels myself. I like the intriguing stories. I like the character development. And I, personally, I think that becomes more challenging to handle when you get to very high levels because you're sort of dealing on a scale that almost becomes a bit inhuman sometimes yeah absolutely so, absolutely i'm i'm not personally a fan of that but it, that's not to say that it doesn't work for others I, I think that the main thing is just that you are aligned in your group on what you want and what does fun mean to you yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely I agree with that. I I look back and I mean, together, Jesper and I have over 30 books out. And I think back to like my first series, my first trilogy, and the characters became quite powerful, especially because they continued on to a second trilogy. So, you know, by by the end of book six, they're pretty kick ass. And that was great. But I look back and I do remember one of a reader commenting, like, I really just liked it when, you know, one of the people who are normal humans got some magic. She's like, I just liked it when she was just herself at the time like no she's she's like super sized now it's wonderful and i look back now and i'm like no i really kind of liked her when she was just an average person i like the stories where you're not constantly struggling for the next big god the next big figure i kind of really agree that it's wonderful to have a story about normal people or very limited power succeeding where they can with their innovation, using things differently. That's much more satisfying to me than higher combat, better spells, more training. It's kind of exhausting in a way. Absolutely. You are you are both so welcome at my table anytime. <laughs> <laughs> if you have tea, I'm there. Oh, we will. We will have tea. There will we always will. be tea. I will invite Rob. He will bring the tea. I will always bring the tea. Uh, but I will I will ask this of, of both of you since you are prolific writers. Uh, 
what is what is a bit of advice you would give people who write worlds and and run these games and are thinking about maybe writing a story or a fiction what would be something you could a bit of advice you could hand to them ooh that's a, that's a very big question you <laughs> I know I know I threw it right here at the end <laughs> here's the keys to the kingdom uh, i would Not say so especially much. if you come from this as a world builder loving to develop the stories remember to keep the focus on the story, like pick, having a character, knowing where you want it to go and just building around that story and not building a five dimensional world when you just need to build this tiny little piece of it to tell the story, keep the story in mind. That's the most important thing. Otherwise you can get so lost. It's so much fun to build worlds and think about what ifs and get lost on side characters and the history and all of those things. But that's not telling the story. So keep it focused on the story you want to tell. Yeah. At the end of the day, the character is the story. So without the character, there is no story. So, you know, focus very much there. Make sure that you create characters who has like real motivations and, and are trying to achieve something for a reason and hopefully also doesn't even understand themselves what it is they, they actually need. They think they need something, but then throughout the course of the adventures and the game and the character development, they figure out that I thought I wanted A, but in reality, it's actually B that I need to become like a better person or, or whatever it is, right? But that's really where the story is. I'm, I'm going to argue that you just told, uh, Autumn just told DMs how to properly create a game, and you just said to <laughs> players how to properly create a character. Now, can we get back to writing fantasy? I mean, <laughs> I feel like there needs to be a difference here. You're, you're hurting my feelings that this is literally the right things to say on both sides. Or, or maybe it's better to say that there really isn't much of a difference in the creation mm -hmm. it's a it's the the implementation is different you know yeah. writing is admittedly putting it down but realistically both of what you said apply exceptionally hard to tabletop yeah you know yeah. we we talk about creating worlds in tabletop worlds and like stop writing what's going on in that mountain top <laughs> nobody cares the players are never going to get there and if they do then you can talk about it but don't mm. it doesn't matter that's scenery as as Jesper, as you were talking, I was I, I thought of like four different topics I'd seen recently that all applied to the advice you just gave. You know, of of uh, you know making sure that you, your your story is character centric, and you see so many storytellers out there trying to go like, well, I've I've built this elaborate world and I've got this plot going on, but none of my players want to engage with it, and it's like. Mm -hmm. Well, are you writing a plot that's interesting to your characters? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, obviously, if they don't want to engage with it, they're that's not the story they want to tell. You know, yeah, uh, and yeah. you know, make your character s dynamic and interested in the world. You know, uh, we've had a we had a recent uh, 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 person who joined our Discord who was talking about they were having problems with a a, uh, a lone wolf in mm -hmm. their group. Yeah, you know, who mm -hmm. didn't want to engage mm -hmm. with the story. And it's like. Oh, it's such good advice all around, and you were so succinct about it. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, it's I I I often look at people who are building, who are writing, uh, and making notes for their games, and recognize that what they're doing is they're building a world setting. Yep, this is a world yep. setting that you're building. You're not building a plot for characters. You've just written a lovely world setting. Okay, what are your characters doing within that world setting? Mm -hmm. Well, they're fighting that guy. Are they? Are they? Is that even part of this? Why? Yeah, you know, you know, there. It's definitely yeah, it's, you know it's all the probably yeah. it's probably like completely natural that this happens. I mean, if we write fantasy, well, we love world building, right? And yeah. game masters, you love world building, so it it's like it happens. It's it's natural. We all know the world building disease that where you just keep building all kinds of stuff that you actually don't need. Mm -hmm. um, so it is really trying to more like. Be mindful that this is world building disease exists and then catch yourself once you start seeing, oh, I'm doing this now. I should, <laughs> yeah. you know, and then wheel back. <laughs> yep. All right. I'm, I'm at a 10. I need to be at around a seven. You yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. Set that stuff aside. That's great notes. We'll keep those over there. But like, that's not what's going on with these characters. All right. Indeed. So then I will, I will ask this of the two of you. Can you let us know about what's coming up for both of you? Uh, books. Uh, uh, you've got the, um, session next year that we need to look forward to and we'll, we'll definitely release some information about that what can you tell us that's what we can look forward to for both of you 
Oh, that's pretty fun. Well, we're actually, well, the biggest thing is if you are interested in content marketing, we are going to be releasing a free skill booster, very cool, very soon. That is um, book marketing without using paid ads. So Ooh. that should be coming up very quickly. And that's on our amwritingfantasy.com website to find out how to sign up for that. Okay. And Jesper's working on writing book three very soon, and I'm working on editing book two in our current Arcane Magic trilogy. So that's hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have book two edited, as well as we have some short stories that are coming out and some other minor things that are coming out this year. So it's a really exciting year. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. definitely make sure everybody's got that up. Uh, anything you want to add, Jesper? Yeah, all those, I mean, all the fiction stuff is uh, at amreadingfantasy.com, and then we have all the author support stuff on amwritingfantasy.com, and then we are also doing, we love podcasts, so we also do <laughs> podcasts. Uh, I... we, have a, we have a couple. Uh, we just actually released the final episode on a limited series called Write the Story. So if you want to learn about creating characters, creating stories, and so on, and basically like get a behind the scenes look so we we decided when we were writing a new short story uh, recently to basically record our conversations where we create all the characters and the storylines and all that good stuff so that's called write the story podcast you can get that on every podcast app you listen to and uh, hopefully pick up some insights at least on how we do it and maybe get inspired by it um, and then I'm also just starting out shortly to s create an audio drama Star Wars podcast. Oh, Ooh, goodness. Okay. Oh, I know <laughs> at least a few of our listeners are going to be into that. Yeah. Uh, where, where can we yeah. find that? Yeah. We'll announce it on uh, amwritingfantasy.com and probably amreadingfantasy. We'll have links once we have it going. All right. Okay. Yeah. okay. We'll definitely kick that'll something. That'll take a while yet, but yeah, it's, we'll... it's slowly starting to build. Sure, sounds, sure, sure. Sounds wonderful. Well, thank you both again uh, We as, as we start our wrap up here. Uh, and uh, we appreciated everything, uh, the, the information, the fun, getting to know both of you and share you with our listeners. Uh, and we look forward to uh, hearing more about uh, your books and uh, the uh, education you guys are doing to help with the community. Absolutely. Autumn Burt and, and Jasper Smith, thank you so much for joining us here in the Conclave. So next, thank, thank you, you so much for having, for having us. us. You're welcome. <laughs> So next week's topic, Sarah, we're doing, uh, we're going back to our storytelling 202 series. Yep. Uh, except we're going to do a a bit of a workshop. In fact, uh, yeah, we're gonna put ourselves on the spot. You know, yeah, kind of give we, you a peek behind the curtain on how the the thought process works. Yeah, I think originally my my idea behind this was is that, uh, uh, and I'll I'll straight up say it, I wanted to fill in a blank mm -hmm. on our schedule, and at the same time, I was like, I like. The craziness of us basically throwing prompts at each other yeah or at least yeah. ideas and saying okay write a prompt for this now right right, um, right. so what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing on the session zero prompting mm -hmm. um which is often kind of challenging because when you've got a big idea or a, a setting maybe you know even an uh, an opening to an adventure you don't want to bake in too much that to to cut your to stifle the players from coming up with their own ideas mm-hmm mm -hmm. But you want to give them just enough of the world and just enough of what the premise of this conflict can be and the struggle is so that, that you, they that you can inspire build... their their own creativity exactly. without hand, giving them pigeonholes that they have to fit into. Exactly, yep. exactly. So hopefully next week we'll uh, we'll get you guys inspired enough to start doing your session zeros and, and building some of those prompts for yourselves. So... All right, awesome. Well, you can find us on Twitter at st underscore conclave, on Instagram at st underscore conclave. Listen to us live every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern time on mixlr.com slash storyteller dash conclave. And uh, join us on our Discord. Uh, shoot us some questions, answer live here on the air, uh, have a great discussion with some of the other storytellers that are there, bounce some campaign ideas. You can find that link on our Twitter as well as our website, storytellerconclave.com. We'd like to thank our Patreon members who support us every single month, especially our name members, Knox in the Box, Subject, Sam, The Arcane Asylum, Sparkle Motion, Veteran, Hulavu, and Sean. We truly appreciate all your support that you give us. Our pre-show music is um, by Arcane Anthems. You can find that at patreon.com slash arcane anthems. Our intro music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. You can find that at geefrog.bandcamp.com or on Google Music. And our outro music, which you're hearing right now, is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine. You can find them at freemusicarchive.org. 
And a big shout out as always to our families, Vicky and Sean. Thank you so much for loving and supporting us. All of our friends who've sat with Sutter Tables over the years to give us these uh, great stories to share with you over the years. Our guests. Our special guests, Autumn, Bert, and Jesper Smith. Thank, thank you, you so much for spending time with us and, uh, and having this great discussion with us tonight. And you, every single one of our listeners, we love you guys so much. We love you. Good night. Good night.